So hi, this is Stu, and we're back for another season of Asana School. And of course, it's been about, I think, about two years since we filmed the last one, so you may see a little bit of degradation <laughs> in things. And Carolina's looking fresher by the year, but I'm not sure about me. Anyway, so we're going to talk today about Badakanasana. And so you've jumped through. We're not going to worry too much this season about um, the vinyasa count and the exact movements because th there's plenty of stuff on our channel that you can, can look at. We're really thinking about um, what is it that stops us doing the postures and how are we going to do the postures if they're not accessible to us. So you've jumped through to Dandasana and now you're going to bring your legs in for uh, Badakanasana A. So there's two parts to this. So when you first bring your feet in, depending on your openness will depend on how closely the feet come to the groin. It also depends sometimes on the distribution of length as far as your lower leg to your upper leg. It may be that you have a disproportionate, <laughs> this, this makes you seem as if you're sort of a bit freakish, but it's not meant that way, a longer lower leg than normal, which is going to sort of force your uh, knees apart. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so they could be, uh, we're thinking of bringing the, the ankles in or the heels into the groin as close as possible or as close as they want to go. Yeah, so bring them in maybe for us, Carolina. Now, you can see that for maybe for some of you, your knees might be up here. And for others, this might be the simplest possible posture you can do. And your knees flop to the floor and you're thinking, what's the big deal? If they're down, well then great. If they're up, then you're already facing problems because really to come forward from that position, nothing much is going to happen. You're just going to probably going to stay the same in the hip and you're just going to round the back as you come forward. So the idea is with A, and we'll show it to you first and then we'll talk about what we could possibly do about it. Now Carolina's going to put her knees where they really are. And the idea with A is that you're going to keep your body as neutral as possible and you're just going to hinge at the hip and bring your chest towards your feet. And you're going to, as Carolina sort of prompted me here, <laughs> you're going to open the soles of your feet as much as possible. I mean, this somewhat activates or tries to encourage the external rotation of the hip because we want them to be rolling out. But actually, you know, if they're not going to go at the hip, they're not going to go at the hip. So. It don't really, really force the, the feet, trying to force them open, um, but just allow them to come open so you don't need to really, really grip and turn them out, but just open them up a bit. Yeah, okay, and so then she's going to come forward and she's going to move as much as she can from here. Yeah, then once you've reached a certain place, I mean, there'll be some of you that can actually come right down flat onto your um, feet, even from that position. And then um, the chances are you're just going to sort of round a little bit to bring your forehead to the floor if you're sort of pretty close, yeah? But this would be a nice position for Carolina, would be this sort of height, because she's still got quite a nice uh, shape to her back. Um, the knees are, are staying down. Cool. Okay, so we'll bring you up from there. So we want to think of some of the things that can happen and some of the things that might be stopping us doing this posture. Basically, this posture is quite simple as far as it's not a complex move as far as what the upper body has got to do. So we're really involved with the hips and what they need to do in order for us to come uh, forward or to sit even comfortably. So the two things that the hips need to do is one is to externally rotate, that's to roll out this way, and the other is for them to abduct, that's to come apart. Yeah? And if you're missing um, either of those movements or the availability of either of those movements, then the chances are that you will be restricted in one of those movements and then you can't come forward. So we can test our ability to externally rotate our hip by just doing something like double pigeon. So if you come into double pigeon, Carolina, for us. Yeah, just sticking one on top of the other. And the shins should be parallel and the tendency is for the bottom leg to tuck under or for the foot to slide down the shin, which makes it easier and makes you think that you're better at this particular position than you are. But it's really just hiding the fact that you actually need to work on your external rotation. So if you see that your feet are like this, then that means you've got good external rotation of the hips, and the chances are it's not going to be your restriction in Vatikanasana. If your knees are up, and so the bottom knee is probably going to be up, and the top knee is probably up, and you might even be dropping back a little bit, this would be like 
quite restricted. <laughs> and so this is not a place you want to be. But if it is something like this, yeah, then it means this is going to be one of your major problems in doing Vatikanesa. And you're probably going to see that your knees are sort of up like this when you're um, trying to do it. So the easiest thing to do would be to work on that restriction. And maybe the simplest position would to be to do something like this, sitting up against the wall trying to get that external rotation of the hip. Yeah? And you could do that as a precursor to your practice, or maybe, depending on your teacher, slide it in before you do this particular posture. And have a straight back. And have a straight back. Yeah, and most of the time it's nice to do it against a wall or against a, a post. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that would give you an idea whether your major restriction is external rotation or not. If it's not external rotation, you can do this, but still, for some reason, your knees are up in the air quite high, then it could be the adductors in the groin, but we might want to check that out. So what we could do in for us that is to just lay on your back. We'll spin you around so your head's this end, Carolina. And okay. you're going to lay on your back, yeah. And then you're going to put your feet in the air, and then you're going to let your legs drop out to the side. I'm going to move forward slightly, and we're just going to keep them in that sort of plane, yeah? So this will give you an idea now as to how easy it is for your legs to abduct, to come apart. Now, again, for some of you, they might be way down to the floor, which means that's not going to be a restriction. But some of you, they may be sort of up, bring your other leg. <laughs> <laughs> so some of you, they may be up like there or somewhere here. So that means then again that your restriction might be in the inner groin or is in the inner groin. And so that will also influence your badakanasana, yeah? Now, it might be that you have both of these things wrong, in which case um, you're in trouble, really. You've <laughs> got to start opening up the body in order to make it a little bit more accessible. So you could do something like um, a wide-legged split but to, to help access this area, but the trouble is we feel it a little bit sort of vulnerable in that position because we've got our weight bearing down and we're a little bit afraid that our feet might just slide out and do us a mischief. So Can I bring up my leg? Yeah, so <laughs> Carolina's <laughs> thinking, ah, but actually that sort of position, now you can see Carolina wanted to come out of that, um, but actually it's quite good because you've got gravity is pulling your legs down, and so it's quite a nice passive way to open the inner groin. So you could do that sort of thing to actually improve your ability to abduct your hips. Um, the other sorts of things you can do are frog. If you want to do frog for us, Carolina is, is um, making sounds. She don't really like frog. I really like it as a posture. Don't have really to like doing it. This one then. Okay, so the this things, is, the th is yeah, and so basically with frog, what we want to do is take our knees as part as far as possible. And so Caroline's doing a different version of the moment. But what we're going to do is easy access is to bring your hips in line with your knees. Yeah, come down on your forearms. Yeah, and now. What we want to think about is the, the feet and the ankles, yeah? What we don't want is to be rotating or twisting the ankles. So the lower you can go, and if you can go quite low, then it's all right, actually, for you to turn the ankles out, yeah? But you might have noticed, as that happened, there's a little bit of rotation of the lower leg relative to the upper leg. Well, that's okay if it's a little bit, but the more you bring your knees in, the more that rotation will happen and the more likely it is to torque your knee. So if you are quite high, then you mustn't have your feet turned out like this. You must point them back. So if we imagine Carolina was a little bit higher, so we bring her up a bit. Yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah, so from there. Now you can see if I tried to turn that ankle out here, you can't maybe see there, but you can see I can put my fingers underneath here, which means that her ankle's not down, which means it's talking the knee, basically. Mm -hmm. So if you feel that, then you need to be pointing your feet back, yeah? If you don't like that, you can also bring the feet together, okay? You can shift backwards and forwards, like Carolina is doing now, and just try and find that point that is the most uncomfortable, really, or the most intense. Generally speaking, it's either directly in line with your knees or a little bit back. And so play with it. but. Know what you're doing rather than just being in a cheating position because it, you think you're doing, but it feels easier. Instead, do the opposite. Find the most uncomfortable place. But uncomfortable is as far as an intense stretch rather than, a, oh, my hip hurts. You know, it shouldn't be doing that, okay? So, we're going to come back to our Badakanasana. I just want to mention one other thing. <laughs> if you do all of, um, if you did those sort of little tests, which is sort of testing our ranges of motion, which make up the components for the posture, and you thought you were pretty good at them, 
but when you come to do Badakonesna, your knees are maybe still here. You can feel them just sort of, the, the thigh is not really grounded on the floor, that's a little bit floated, yeah? We'll never go like completely, completely flat because of course you've got your thigh in the way. So it depends on, like Carolina's thighs are resting on the floor now. If I push down on her knees, it's more likely to pull her pelvis up in the air. But say that they were a little bit higher and then there was sort of some room here, yet you are open in all these directions, then something else comes into play that actually is really, really important. And that is the fact it could be the construction of your hip joint itself, the structure of your hip joint, that is actually stopping your knees going down. Well, that is a whole different thing altogether and we need to be very careful of that because what we don't want to do is try and force our way down. Let's say we want to push down and we're going to get somebody to stand us and we're going to load up the sandbags with the idea of, I've been practicing 20 years, I want those knees on the floor. What we'll do is we'll hurt the actual joint itself because it means the design of the joint is such that it's the alignment of the, the femur to the hip socket is such that actually it's not meant to go down for you. Yeah? And if you keep on forcing it down, you're going to hurt the hip socket. So if you've done all that sort of testing and they're still not down, then the chances are it's maybe the actual construction of the hip joint. So you might have to just accept the fact that that's going to be where they are. Okay? So that's a really important differentiation to make between is it my structure or is it just the soft tissue that's stopping me. Okay? So once we, once we try to figure out what we can do and we know that now we're going to do the posture, the main thing is to maybe hold this for a little bit longer and take some extra breaths. With, with different postures, there's, there's two ways that I think of them really. One is a posture that is what I call a working posture and another posture would be maybe a display of uh, range of motion. So Padmasana or Lotus posture for me is a display of range of motion that you are very open and you wouldn't necessarily want to sit in it for a long time to get better at it. But Baddhikonasana on the other hand is one of those postures where there's not a lot going on, there's not a lot that you can damage um, so it's perfectly fine to sit in it for a lot longer. So if you want to get better at Baddhikonasana, sometimes one of the best things to do is just sit in it for 10 or 15 minutes a day up against the wall, keeping your back straight and letting gravity take your legs to the floor. Okay? Main thing is start with a shorter time and gradually work up rather than just go, okay, I'm going to sit here and read a book or watch the TV and forget about it. If you'll be there for half an hour for your first time, it might be a little bit fun trying to close your legs again. Okay? So this gives us a sort of the right position to be in. Now, you can imagine that Baddhikonasana is a half of a Janusha Shasana. So, if we now bring this leg straight, you could see that that is the same leg as a Janusha Shasana leg. And so we would expect really that our knee should also be the same sort of height when we're doing Janusha Shasana A. If you notice that in Janusha Shasana A your knee drops down much more than it does when you're in Baddhikonasana, it may be that you're just tilting your pelvis over. So this is just a little sort of reminder to just check in on your uh, Janusha Shasana as well. Okay? So if we go back to our Baddhikonasana just for one sec, and a lot of people have things going on with their knees. Maybe they've aggravated it doing a half Padmasana or maybe they've aggravated it in another sport but they quite often get discomfort around this sort of the joint on the inner joint of the knee, sort of about here. When it comes to Baddhikonasana, it can actually aggravate the knee if you've already got something going on. And the reason that can happen is because if you're trying to fold forwards and you've already used up your rotation in the hip and you keep trying to go forwards, what it will do is it will take the thigh and rotate it with the hip. But because our lower leg is fixed on the floor, the lower leg can't move with the upper leg. So what tends to happen is the upper leg rela rotates relative to the lower leg and can pinch the knee. Yeah? So if you've already got a knee issue going on, then Baddhikonasana is one of those ones that you need to sort of watch and be careful of and not go too deep because it can keep it aggravating and can keep it going up along. Yeah? So we've seen A and then we change to B, which is a rounded position. So most of the time we're saying, don't round, don't round, don't round, and then all of a sudden we've got this posture where it seems okay to round. I'm going to say it's because the knees are bent, not straight, so it's taking the pressure off the low back because the hamstrings are now released. And so, you know, it's not that we should never round our back, and so this is a good example of where maybe we're accessing the back line 
and allowing ourselves to round. So the idea is that the head comes in between the feet, Carolina's are sort of in front of the feet. It really depends on how bendy your spine is and maybe how long your legs are and where they are and everything else. But basically that is the sort of intention is that you're rounding um, and allowing yourself and allowing gravity to bring you towards the floor. Again, you may find this easier or less easy depending on what's going on in your hips. The chances are most of you will think B is nicer than A because you don't have to move potentially as much at the hip joint because you're rounding the spine, so it seems like you're coming further to the floor. Yeah. Um, that's about it as far as these postures go, isn't it? There's, um, it's a really nice posture. I like Badakanasana. It really is useful for opening the hips and one of those ones that I say you can spend some extra time and extra breaths and it's quite rewarding once the, the knees start dropping to the floor. So have a play with that. Hopefully it will be useful to you and join us again for Asana School very soon. It's very nice. <laughs> it's kind of, you know, it's not too long. That's what I thought. Yeah, I'm talking a bit faster, but I thought no, but I'll try and keep it down. Yeah, yeah. try and keep the time down. <laughs> Just as long as my brain can keep up with my mouth, I'll be all right.